Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 17th installment of EO Exchange. This one's on supply chain. And uh, again, the format for today, the last 15 minutes this morning, we want you guys to make connections and you'll get in a small group, have a chance to share a personal experience and talk about our topic today, as well as kind of share some stories. Um, there's going to be a survey put in the chat at some point, please, or you're going to get an email, please fill out the survey. It's very helpful. Um, first 30 minutes is going to be uh, Scott McWilliams and Jimmy Green, and I'm going to tell you guys who they are in just a second. Um, first 30 minutes will be with that, about 15 minutes of Q&A, and then we'll get into our small groups. Um, really quickly, so Jimmy's obviously a member of, of EO Nashville. Um, Scott McWilliams, I'll give a quick bio. He's a fellow University of Tennessee graduate. He has a um, vast experience in, in, this, in this industry. Currently a small business owner and works for a private equity firm. After retiring from Geodis, who is with for 28 years, sits on five logistics and distribution companies on their boards. In addition to serving as past president of the Southeastern Warehouse Association, University of Tennessee Global Supply Chain Advisory Board, the American Heart Association, National Area Habitat for Humanity, Rural Range USA, and the United Way of Metro Nashville. Prior to joining Geodis, uh, Scott worked for the Kroger Company, Super X Food and Drug for nine years, and uh, supply chain management in Nashville, Atlanta, and Tampa. He was certified to drive big rigs in case of labor strikes, which I can't wait to hear some of those stories. Um, very vast insights, and thank you for being here. Um, Jimmy Green owns seven different companies, or several different companies, um, related to this topic, India Office Furniture. He's a 17 state regional wholesaler with three distribution centers, sorry. India has its own fleet of trucks and they utilize three PLs. They typically receive 500 containers a year from Asia, South America, and Eastern Europe. So he's obviously probably seen a lot and especially in the last year. Um, so welcome to both you guys. And really what I'm gonna do first is let Jimmy tell a little bit of his story, then let, let Scott come in behind and uh, put a little color and insight to all of that and then we'll get going about uh, 930 on questions. Please, as you have questions come up, just go ahead and throw them in the chat. That way we have some already in the queue when 930 comes around. All right, Jimmy, take it away. Absolutely. So uh, the struggles that we have is 80% of our business is receiving containers from overseas. We are purely a wholesale distributor. We sell to office furniture resellers, retailers. So we're moving boxes basically. Um, two struggles that we've had in our supply chain is one is COVID, countries shutting down, um, reopening, trying to catch up. Currently, Malaysia and Vietnam have are, are shut down, so we get a lot of product out of those, and uh, that's a problem. The other is uh, the demand for containers, the lack of ship space, the lack of containers. Um, many of our manufacturers have made our product and it's sitting in every single corner of their warehouse, uh, tr just praying that we get a container to them to uh, get it on a ship and so are we. Um, so that it started, it started about fall of, of 2020, of uh, the interruptions. Uh, and, and then the big first notification was when we went to negotiate for what our prices were going to be for our for our containers in March, uh, they said, well, you can have a fixed rate for 60% of your typical business. The rest, we're going to float and get paid whatever the market is. And that was the first big sign. However, if I could just get 60% of my allocation, that would be great too. Uh, currently, the demand is so strong in the, in the world economy that um, I'm not worried about the floating rates at the moment. The fixed rates if I could get 60%, that would be fantastic. So those are the, those are the struggles we're dealing with. Uh, the reclosings of countries um, is a big problem. We do have our own domestic fleet, which has given us a great advantage over our competitors that use all third party um, domestic logistics, but we still have to utilize that channel as well. And that's twice as much as usual if you can get a truck and a driver. That's my struggles. A bunch of simple answers, right, Scott? Uh, yeah, lots of simple answers. Uh, so we have limited time here today. So there's really two specific topics I wanted to talk about. One is uh, ocean freight and uh, the current 
uh, capacity shortages, as well as what's going on at our domestic ports. And then secondly, I wanna talk about uh, the trucking industry and what's going on there in terms of rates, drivers, and availability. So if, uh, if you look at the last 18 months, much like Jimmy described, everybody and their brothers having problems getting different kinds of products into the US. It could be components or it could be finished goods. <clears throat> right now, the, the port of Long, Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, which sits just inside the San Pedro Bay, handles about a million TEUs a month. Uh, TEU is a 20 foot equivalent unit. You've seen these boxes going down the road, primarily from here to Memphis. Uh, but that's how they measure the, the capacity on container ships. So if you remember the Evergreen that got caught in the Suez Canal, that had a capacity of 20,000 TEUs. Um, pricing has tripled on the most popular trade routes for ocean freight, much like Jimmy described. So Shanghai to LA, Hong Kong to LA, uh, and the prices going to the East Coast through the Panama Canal have, have as much as tripled. And so right now, the Port of LA and Long Beach has between 21 and 40 ships anchored out in San Pedro Bay, waiting for between 21 and 40 days to unload at the port. If you recall, when COVID hit, uh, the state of California was probably the quickest state to really move to a lockdown, and that affected the ports dramatically. And I think what's interesting about the supply chain is if you take the crane operators or you take the drivers or the draymen or the longshoremen out for two weeks, that just ripples back through the entire supply chain all the way back to Southeast Asia. Um, so you've got that problem um, and it's exacerbated other areas including air freight and then domestic transportation. For those of you who may have ordered a Peloton last year, uh, those are made in Taiwan. And Peloton spent $120 million in air freight to get those machines to the US for their customers. So you can imagine if you have a product like a Peloton or furniture, what the additional cost is gonna to be to get that product to your distribution center. Um, what we're also seeing is because of the congestion on the Western, Western ports, Seattle, Oakland, Long Beach specifically, that you've got customers diverting their freight from Southeast Asia through the Suez Canal to primarily the ports of Savannah and Charleston. You remember we had a snowstorm in January, an ice storm, and uh, the port of Savannah got backed up. I was actually down there and saw this. So they can handle about 40,000 boxes on the ground in Savannah. They had 82,000 boxes uh, in the Savannah area. So they were putting them pretty much anywhere they could get them. In addition to that, the railroads were shut down for almost five days with ice on their, on their rails. So nothing moved out of, support of the Port of Savannah for, for over six days. Um, the other thing you're probably aware of is the shortage of microchips. So 43% of all the microprocessors are made in Korea and Taiwan. The US only makes about 12% of the global volume. China makes about 15%. So if you're like me, who ordered a car last February and still has yet to see it, uh, it's because there's a shortage of microprocessors. You know, currently up in Louisville, if you go by the racetrack, you'll see about 25,000 Ford F-250 trucks that have been completed from the manufacturing standpoint, but still don't have the microchips in the trucks so they can run those trucks. Um, it looks like the microchip shortage is going to continue to last for between 26 and 60 weeks. So well over a year before we're gonna see microprocessors back into our economy. Now I'd like to go over and talk about uh, some more good news, uh, which is the transportation industry. <clears throat> so if you look at the transportation industry, there's several components. You've got private carriers, like the fleet that Jimmy described. You've got over the road, long haul truckers. You have the LTL, less than truckload. Uh, market, and then you have uh, draymen. Draymen are the people that move the containers from the port to a distribution center. Uh, the average age of the truck drivers in the United States is 49 years old. 25% of all the over-the-road truck drivers are over the age of 55. Currently, there are 54,000 former truck drivers who cannot drive anymore because of the enhanced testing for drugs, substance abuse, uh, marijuana, and, and other types of, of uh, or, or they have a DUI conviction. 
So we lost 54,000 truckers in the last three years because of that. A few years ago, the industry also mandated uh, what are called ELDs. So in the past, a truck driver could either work 60 hours in seven days or 70 hours in eight days. And that included 10 hours of driving and then five hours of what's called on-duty time. So that is the time that they spend either loading or unloading their truck at a distribution center. When the industry went to ELDs, these are electronic log data machines that are connected to the truck. So, you know, you see all the commercials about the personal injury attorneys, and there may be a few on this call, uh, nothing against them. But back in the day before ELDs, you had drivers that were running 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week and obviously falling asleep and causing massive truck accidents. Um, the safety level within the truck driving industry has improved significantly because they use the ELDs. The downside is there's a lot less capacity from the existing staff that are driving these trucks today. The other problem with the industry, and I was talking to Samir about this, uh, it's a really bad lifestyle. So there are over 400,000 over the road truckers. These are the guys that you see that pull into the Love's truck stop or a, another truck stop and uh, wait for their number to be called so they can take a shower. Um, they make about $47,000 a year and they're gone typically for five to seven days a week. Often they get stranded at some location because they can't get uh, another load to pick up or a backhaul. Um, so with a $47,000 median income uh, and you're working typically 60 to 70 hours uh, a week and you're either sleeping in your tractor or some rundown hotel, it's not a very glamorous lifestyle. You also have to be at least 21 years of age to drive a truck. And there are some moves in the legislature, uh, specifically uh, the House of Representatives to try to get that dropped to 18 years old so they could pick up some of the uh, 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 workforce that's coming out of the military. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, if you look at the trucking industry, 91% of all over the road for hire trucking companies are six tractors or less. So this is an entrepreneur that owns five or six tractors and is trying to make the payments on his equipment, pay for his fuel, pay his fuel taxes, and pay his drivers enough to keep them. And with the turnover rate of well over 100 percent, some some truckload carriers have turnover of over 200 percent. It's very difficult to keep a driver in the seat and keep that truck on the road. Currently, right now, there are over four million job postings for drivers who have a commercial driver's license. And as I think we all see today, uh, the staffing shortages that we see in every facet of our economy continue to get worse and worse. Freight rates are expected to go up. Uh, freight rates since 2017, excuse me, freight rates since 2019, this is both over the road, uh, truckload and LTL, have gone up 30% in the last two years. And those are projected to continue to go up at least two to three X what our GDP growth is. So folks like Jimmy are gonna to have to pay a lot more freight for their products. And I think us as consumers have to be aware that we're gonna be paying a lot more for the products that we buy, sell and consume. So Samira asked me to talk about what I thought would be the 2021 supply chain trends. So I've got eight or nine here that I'd like to share with you. Um, first of all, I think more companies are going to tend to focus on the products and services that they offer, and there will be more outsourcing going forward. So companies like Geotis, the company that I recently retired from, uh, they're going to see continued trends in their business. So the five boards that I sit on are all third-party logistics providers. I think the lowest growth company of those five is, is north of 15% this year. Um, second is I think we're going to see continued uh, high double digit growth in e-commerce. Everybody knows about that. There's no bulletin there, except you gotta have to continue to have the capacity to be able to handle that. Uh, my son works for a real estate company that does all of the industrial real estate work for Amazon in North America. Um, he's been extremely busy. Uh, Amazon generates about uh, six different footprints of distribution centers. Y'all are probably familiar with some of the ones you see on I-24 and 840. Uh, the recently completed 100, 100 um, well, it's 100 feet high. It's a 3.2 million square foot building out in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, 
And so they're continuing to build these DCs in order to increase their network and their coverage. Those of you that are uh, Amazon Prime customers know how great it is to order something in the morning, get it there in the afternoon. And so you're gonna see more you know, inner city fulfillment centers, much like the one over off Brick Church Pike that Amazon operates there. Uh, and you're gonna see more companies, both third-party logistics providers, as well as companies like Walmart and Target move into that space as well. Um, number three, labor shortages. I mean, again, no bulletin here, but it's especially dramatic in the transportation and logistics space because the uh, jobs historically are, uh, they're hard work. Uh, they're typically done in ambient temperature facilities um, and uh, they work long hours. And especially during Q4, when we have our holiday rush, uh, there's lots of mandatory overtime uh, and it's not a great industry to work in. Uh, number four, more focus on uh, environmental social governance and sustainability. I was on a conference call yesterday with a company I'm working with. They're going to build a, a new uh, aluminum can manufacturing plant. It'll be 500 million cans a year. Um, and so what you've seen is a dramatic shift away from PET plastics uh, in glass and more to aluminum. Uh, Dasani recently uh, opened up their uh, aluminum can uh, water plant. Um, and so I think we're going to see a lot more um, focus on what companies are doing uh, for not only the environment, but also uh, their communities. Uh, number five is increasing focus on redundancy. As we all saw during uh, COVID, uh, more companies are spending money on their systems, um, their networks, uh, and redundant suppliers. So uh, nearshoring is gonna be another uh, big trend going forward. Uh, as we saw from the pharmaceutical industry, we've seen from the automotive industry, uh, we just can't get uh, the raw materials here quick enough to be able to respond to supply chain disruptions. Uh, number seven is improving resilience. So uh, more visibility and real-time monitoring of supply chains. So I need to know when a ship left a port overseas. I need to know when the ship landed at Long, Long, uh, uh, LA Long Beach. I need to know when those containers have been grounded, when those containers have been put on a chassis. Uh, right now, there's a huge shortage of chassis. Uh, chassis is the frame that the container sits on uh, that they dray to your facility. Um, two years ago, a, a, a container chassis was $12,000. Uh, a company I work with right now just bought 50 last week. They're now $22,000. Um, number eight is, is uh, reduced tra transportation capacity with higher uh, price volatility. So again, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, I don't care whether you're talking about trucks, um, airlines, uh, Uber, Lyft, uh, we're going to continue to see constraints in those areas, and it's going to affect both pricing and availability. And lastly, uh, is increasing efforts to eliminate labor. So in the warehousing side of the business, uh, we, have, we have spent an enormous amount of money in automation, in robots. If you've seen the videos on the Amazon distribution centers, that's becoming more of the norm than the exception. Uh, you're going to see a lot more robotics, uh, more artificial intelligence, and uh, sometime in the near future, you're gonna see driverless trucks. They're already in uh, Utah and they're in Texas. Uh, so look out for those on the highway. So Richard, I think that's, that's all I have. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's all news, doesn't have to all be good news, right? So <laughs> this is the way that works. I, I appreciate that and, and it's, uh, it's, it's great information. If you have some questions, let's go ahead and we'll start rolling into some of those. Um, you know, Jimmy, that's exactly what you're seeing, I guess. I mean, is it like you just checking off the list as he was going down the, the topics? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I might just expand for, on a little bit of what Scott said about bringing business back home. Um, everybody uh, in the distribution business has, um, you know, used to getting products from Asia um, and now they can't get it. Um, there's only one communist, you know, government that's ever been successful, and that has been the Chinese, thanks to the United States backing them and, and let them manufacture everything for us. However, the trend, as Scott mentioned, not only in the, the aluminum side, but there's 17 steel plants being built right now in the great USA. Uh, we've got several relationships in Mexico and Canada, and um, 
I'm fortunate that I had those relationships already because we're we're pouring more and more of our buying power above the border, below the border, because we don't have to depend upon a container uh, to get it to us. And uh, you know, they were we just had a bunch of vendor meetings this week, and they were all in saying we're being bombarded by opportunities. So uh, the the landscape is changing uh, dramatically for North America, which I think is going to be positive for for the North American worker. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, let's start rolling through some of the questions. Keep them coming in there and, and we'll go through. Um, Sarah Wright, uh, what changes do you predict? I think this was for Scott or for both of you. What changes do you predict or foresee in the future of transportation with an emphasis on electrically powered vehicles or more environmentally friendly options? Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a move to go to EVs for over the road trucks, uh, obviously because of uh, diesel taxes, um, diesel pollutants. Uh, you're seeing initiatives in uh, California specifically. So this is a law that goes into effect next year. So if you operate a distribution center in uh, Los Angeles or the surrounding counties, you will have to log every truck that comes onto your property determine what size engine it has, the dwell time at the distribution center, the amount of time that the tractor ran at your facility, and you will be paying taxes on those costs. So obviously there's, there's a trend more to, to the electric vehicles. Uh, we saw similar trends years ago when we went from manual transmissions um, on over the road tractors to automatics. The truck drivers initially said, no, I'm a truck driver. I wanna be able to grind my gears. Uh, and then they said, no, I, I can just sit behind the wheel and drive this tractor trailer like you can drive your passenger car. So I, I think you'll see uh, continued more initiatives on electric vehicles. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Scott Anderson is asking is what things are not, so obviously things are not improving. How slow do we estimate holiday goods shipping will be? And do we foresee when shipping prices will normalize or possibly return to pre-COVID levels? So right now, 6.2% uh, of all the ocean uh, vessels are mothballed. They're either in for maintenance, uh, they're damaged, um, they are antiquated. So that capacity is not going to be coming online anytime soon. Uh, that being said, there's about a, uh, gosh, I can't remember the number, um, but there are a large number of vessels that are currently in shipyards being built. And obviously those, those ships are going to be faster and have a higher capacity than the older ships. So again, if you look at the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, the Evergreen ship, um, that had a capacity of 20,000 TEUs. Now, previous to that, the largest ship you could take through the Suez or the uh, Panama Canal was about 14,000 TEUs. So you're picking up about 40% more capacity on the same ship. Um, I think based on what I have read and researched, um, you're gonna see transportation rates normalize uh, probably in the next 18 to 24 months, assuming we don't see a huge spike in fuel costs. Uh, but I think this holiday season, and I saw a comment earlier, this holiday season is going to be worse than last year's in terms of availability of products. And Jimmy, I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be really rough uh, for not only the rest of this year, but the beginning of next year. Um, I think a few tail signs the first one for me is what are negotiations going to look like in March when I sit down to figure out how many containers I can get on a fixed rate and what that's going to look like will be the first real uh, telltale sign for 2022 for me. Um, there are, uh, there's a company, I believe it's publicly traded called Trenton that makes uh, containers. Uh, that's not a bad one to put on, you know, on your screen to follow their stock. That would be a good indicator for all of us um, to see what's going on. It's T-R-I-T-O-N. And uh, they are at full capacity making containers as fast as they possibly can. Of course, they're charging twice as much, three times as much in the past. But uh, that's also another good indicator of what's going on. You know, I think I have a habit of blaming COVID on everything, uh, blaming everything on COVID, I should say. And um, I'm wondering, you know, we obviously, the driver shortage has been something that's been around, we've seen coming, you know, down the pike. What, what out of the different things you've talked about, you know, what, what, what has predated COVID and, and did we, you know, what did we see coming 
and how have we maneuvered that? Is that a reasonable question or is that for? Somebody? No, I think, I think it's a great question. I was just discussing this with somebody the other day is, um, as all of us, I think have experienced, there were people that um, COVID in the context of their business career gave them decision to just, I'm done. I'm retiring, I'm quitting, whatever. Um, there were tens of thousands of truck drivers that made that decision. And if you, if you remember what happened during the early stages of COVID, there were trucks that got stuck all over the United States with, you know, a load of produce or, you know, you're 3000 miles away from home with a load you can't get unloaded, but you're responsible for it. So you can't, you can't just vacate the truck. So there are, there are a lot of people that uh, elected during COVID not to return to the profession. And I think that's another reason why we are where we are today. Um, and we've seen this in a lot of other professions as well, where people just said, I know a lot of doctor friends that just said, hey, I'm, I'm done, I'm retiring. I was gonna wait till I was 62 or 63, but I'm gonna go ahead and go now. And Scott, mention where some of these truck drivers have gone. I find that kind of interesting. Well, so uh, the biggest source for, for truck drivers, and you'll see this in any market, um, is uh, you can get, uh, so a truck driver with a commercial driver's license can basically drive anything. <clears throat> so typically what you do when you have a downturn in the economy, uh, which we obviously haven't had one in quite a while, but when you have a downturn in the economy, the truck drivers move from driving over the road trucks to driving construction equipment, bulldozers, dump trucks, track hose, uh, things like that. Um, so usually when the housing market slows down and they go back to driving trucks. Well, we all know what's going on with the housing market right now. So um, a lot of the former sources of employment in the trucking industry, those, those sources just aren't, they don't exist today. Hence, hence the uh, proposed legislation to reduce the, uh, the uh, age to drive a, a commercial truck from 21 to 18. And you mentioned so many have gone to Amazon, right? Because it's so flexible and you can make good money. And yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I can drive a, a, a van around, you know, West Nashville and deliver packages for six hours a day if I want, or I can deliver them for 12 hours a day if I want. Uh, I can pick my routes. I can work the hours I want. Uh, I'm in an air-conditioned vehicle. Uh, you know, the biggest challenge I got is trying to unload the barbell set or the, you know, outdoor furniture or something at your house. Yeah. Here you um, talking about rail, uh, Wade Miller's asking about rail. Uh, do you see rail use increasing and opening of more rail lines? I have a lot of opinions on rail, but uh, I'd love to hear yours. You know, I, I should have pulled some statistics for this, um, but you look at the amount of trackage that's added in the United States every year, it's like under 100 miles. Uh, think about how, how long it would take to buy the right of way along an existing rail spur to be able to dual line. Um, so, you know, uh, the Alameda corridor in LA, which basically provides rail transportation from the port of LA Long Beach to the Inland Empire, all the way out to Rialto and Wet, uh, Redlands, uh, was built for the specific reason of pulling those trucks off the highways and be able to get those containers to the Inland Empire quicker. Today, if you were to drive from the port of LA Long Beach to Rialto, given the traffic, it could take you as long as six hours. Uh, they can get those containers from the port once they get them on the, on the rail uh, to the Inland Empire in less than an hour. Uh, but the railroads, you know, they have made their bread and butter on commodities. Uh, I, you, I mean, my first job out of college was, I was a rail receiving supervisor at Kroger. and We used to unload 50 rail cars a week. Uh, you, you rarely see any commercial or uh, uh, consumer goods on rail cars anymore. We, my world was manufacturing and we, I would, I think I know exactly what I'm saying when I say this. I would rather do manufacturing business in California than have to deal with the railroad. Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's the worst. Worst customer yeah. service organization in the world. You the may government. or may not get it in plus or minus a month and they don't care. So it's, I've never seen anything like it in my life, but it's, it's the craziest thing. So unfortunately, Wade, I think the answer to that is no, <laughs> in, my, in my opinion. But um, another question he had was how, how are the Chinese purchasing, how is the Chinese purchasing of manufacturing plants in Europe, especially Italy, and bringing in their people to run the factories affecting the supply chain trend and the long-term effects of them controlling more manufacturing in Europe overall? I have no knowledge on that topic. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was a pretty big question. Um, what's that about um, the the labor in those markets? Of what, what was that exactly about? So Wade, pop on here if you want to pop on there. Maybe we can understand a little better the question. Yeah, sure. Um, we we're working on some projects and uh, a couple of them where we have uh, manufacturers of. Uh, uh, in, in China, and they said their plants have basically been taken over, and probably because they control all the debt, China's come in and just basically overtaking leather goods, metal goods, other manufacturing. In one case, we're working with the uh, manufacturers of, of steel roller mills. Uh, we're working with certain the Italians, but they said it's all being run by their, China's basically taken over the company. And so they're bringing in a lot of their own people to run management, and even in some cases to run all the labor. So I just wondered how that trend's going to affect things where We've been sending things to China, but China wants to now be able to say made in Italy, made in France, such and such, but they're still controlling the manufacturing. How's that going to affect things globally? Because they're essentially spreading their ownership and looking like it's domestic in another country, but they're still the ones controlling the manufacturing. Uh, I can just share my experience uh, in Vietnam. Uh, we deal with a couple of Vietnam manufacturers and they're all Chinese owned. Um, you, the one yeah, thing they, they outsource cheap labor as well. Yeah, you know, in China they they house their workers right there on site, so they don't get to go home in, until Chinese New Year. Um, but um, everything's provided them from meals to a workout place, a gymnasium. Uh, that's not the way it is in Vietnam. The attitudes are different. Um, but um, I don't I don't have any experience with Italy. Uh, I can tell you, I do have some experience. Uh, also, in Mexico, that a lot of Chinese firms have opened shop down there. Uh, so, you know, China is going to be here somewhere. Maybe not in their own country, but we're we're definitely dealing with them. Uh, I have not seen them in any of the Eastern European uh, manufacturers. So that's well. Yeah, the question really is, how's that going to really affect the global chain? You essentially have one superpower controlling more than what we um, on the surface think they're controlling. Um, and, and that means they have more say in how they want to distribute goods. <clears throat> so no, no real thoughts on that, Scott? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Most of my time was spent in France, not in Italy, so I'm not familiar with uh, what's going on there. Well, I mean, so, I saw the Bahamas too, did a job in the Bahamas and they had, uh, they were supposed to be under contract to use Bahamian labor, and I don't know if you guys probably know, everybody's been there, you know, they're their work ethics a little different and they brought in 3,000 Chinese and put man camps up and just brought them in and had them work for three years rebuilding the Bahamar resort. Wow. So, yeah. uh, let, let me answer a, a question David Jones asked. So it says, uh, David said, do you see any positive short-term impact more focused on supply chain management as a course of study in college and colleges and universities? Uh, the answer to that is, is absolutely yes. So, um, you know, we talked about UT earlier, but, uh, you know, the top five schools that are ranked every year uh, as the best supply chain programs in the United States uh, usually starts with Michigan State University, Arizona State University, Penn State University, UT, and MIT. Um, and I looked at the last year's rankings and MSU was, was number one again. Um, I shared with Samira, right now, the, the largest major in the School of Business at UT is the supply chain program. There's over 1,400 students in that program at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Um, the salaries that these folks are getting coming out of their undergraduate programs and their graduate programs are very high uh, relative to some of the other traditional programs like finance and, and, and real estate and accounting. So. Um, and recently, you've seen uh, both Lipscomb and Belmont uh, introduce their supply chain programs. I've worked with uh, Tennessee State University uh, developing um, their program as well. Um, HBCUs are, are, are moving this way. Um, I wish they'd move that way uh, sooner, but um, they have lots of great support from major Fortune 500 companies. Um, and I think it's a tremendous career to, to pursue. Perfect. And I'm going to um, drop down to Samira's next question, which I think is perfect as well, is uh, share any thoughts on how this will affect us in Middle Tennessee specifically. 
and also what kind of color can you put on to, you know, while we are such a hot distribution center, um, you know, now, so. Yeah, um, so great question. So, so let me start by just sharing you kind of some, uh, uh, some history. Um, so when I started Osborne Hesse Logistics, we were a $9 million company with about two and a half million square feet of space uh, in Middle Tennessee and Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, we grew that company to uh, currently it's 55 million square feet of space. Um, and so we're in 24 different countries, uh, just in the Americas. Um, but what you see in the United States is typically, and, and Jimmy can attest to this, uh, uh, companies put together their distribution networks based upon uh, populations and the time to serve a given market and availability of products. So when you look at a network across the United States, again, it depends on the company. Uh, I'll pick one, Starbucks or Apple, which I have a lot of experience with. So um, Starbucks has uh, five distribution centers. They have one in Seattle, Kent, Washington, uh, one in um, Reno, Nevada, Carson City, um, one in Nashville, Mount Juliet, uh, one in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and um, uh, fifth one in Dallas, Texas. So most companies will have a network that encompasses the West, uh, the Southwest, the Midwest, and the Northeast. So you generally have a minimum of three DCs, again, depending on the size and volume of these, you'd have four or five. Well, what became a real hot spot, as we all know, was Memphis. Um, and so when companies are doing their analysis on where to put distribution centers, they typically have one either Nashville, Memphis, Louisville, or Cincinnati. Uh, on the Southeast, you're gonna be in typically Atlanta to service both Florida and the Southeast. Uh, in the Northeast, where you used to go to New Jersey on the uh, turnpike up around Cranberry, uh, most of that um, tonnage and most of those buildings are now in Southeastern PA. So you wanna be in uh, Harrisburg, Mechanicsburg, uh, places like that. 75% um, of the U.S. population li lives within a 500-mile drive of, of Nashville, and ironically, the most number of miles you can drive in a tractor trailer is about 550. So that's one of the reasons why uh, Nashville continues to be a hot spot for distribution centers. Um, the last D.C. that I worked with before I retired was a new 1.2 million square foot distribution center for Apple out in Mount Juliet. Um, it is a totally air-conditioned building. Um, I, I wish I knew what the utility bill was per month, but it's, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, and that building typically carries six to seven billion dollars worth of inventory in that one facility. Wow. Yeah, if y'all have not driven to some of these outlying counties, especially like 840 going towards, I guess I was going towards Knoxville. There's distribution centers have popped up overnight. I didn't even know they were there, like rooms to go and Napa auto parts and all kinds of crazy stuff. It just seemed like it happened overnight. Yep. As a kid that grew up in Lebanon, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I hear you. I hear you. So awesome. Um, what I had another question. Um, on the I want to go back to one of the things y'all were uh, Scott, you were talking about earlier on about the 21 to 40. Uh, ships sitting out in off the coast of LA. Um, what that that was going on too well before COVID, right or no? So um, not, not 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 typically. I mean, there's always a few ships anchored out there. But what happened at COVID? It peaked at around 65 ships, and there's actually an app that you can pull up, and it will show you uh, the name of the ship and the date that it was anchored there and how long it's been there. Okay. And uh, it's, it's just fascinating to me that the, there's such a backlog in uh, capacity at the port. And quite frankly, it's the port of LA Long Beach. It's, it's landlocked. Um, it's an old port um, and it's longshoreman labor. It's the most inefficient port in the entire United States by far. Uh, Savannah and Charleston. Savannah's capacity, although limited uh, compared to LA Long Beach, uh, they can unload about three times as many containers per hour down there as they can in LA Long Beach. Interesting. Cool. Anybody else? This is great. We can did we cover Scott Anderson's other question. Scott, did we cover all you had? 
Yeah, on the smaller fulfillment teams, uh, smaller fulfillment logistics teams can create strategic advantage during a season without investing in automation and robotics. Okay, great question. Uh, I'm working with a small company in Alabama right now. Uh, the gentleman is an Auburn grad. Uh, he started an e-commerce fulfillment company three years ago. It's grown 500%. Um, he's taken kind of a non-traditional way of looking at it, which is all about customer service. So this gentleman uh, wrote his own warehouse management system, his own warehouse execution system. Uh, he makes uh, heavy use of Salesforce CRM with his customers. He has about a 99.98% accuracy and fill rate on his orders for his customers. Um, and, uh, you know, it, he has invested very little capital in this business. But um, there's a lot of smaller players getting into the space. And I think if you focus on customer service and your order fill rate and accuracy, you can compete with just about anyone. There's a lot of people don't want to do business with Amazon uh, for, for numerous reasons. Um, and so I think there's, there's lots of opportunity in this space for other players. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. I do have one more question real quick. Do you, do you have any insight on this, this new startup flock freight that's doing these, um, you know, that, that's got this huge investment of capital and, and I what kind of impact that's going to have on smaller truckloads or uh, Scott, that's, that's a great question. Uh, there's probably about eight different companies that are out there in this space looking at, at trying to uh, answer this problem. Uh, Uber Freight was one of the first. Um, there's not a clear winner anymore. I would tell you that there's a lot of venture capital and private equity money chasing these companies to see who's going to win. Um, we looked at buying, I worked for a private equity firm after I retired called Welsh Carson, Anderson and Stowe. Uh, we were looking at buying some of these businesses and they were quoting two times revenue as a purchase price, not a multiple of, of earnings or a multiple of EBITDA. So um, I, I'm not sure who the winner is going to be, but somebody, when they, when they figure this out, is, is going to do very, very well. Awesome. I think it is about time to roll into our small groups and just a couple things. There's going to be uh, two questions. I think Marley, you're going to put them in the chat. Are they already there? Probably.